Hello and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where a single makerspace director and two regular members <laughs> talk about making stuff and maker culture. My name is Aaron, and joining me are Joe and Christian. Do you guys see what I did there? Uh, I don't you know. Like, absolutely. I the, had that planned all week. The the treasurer, <laughs> we're, we're still in officer's chat. And the <laughs> treasurer wants us to oh, stick you around. So. Yeah. I, 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 I think I'm still a director, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I saw January 1st click around and I disconnected. Yeah, I saw that. I should have. <laughs> <laughs> nah you'll you'll do good you'll uh you'll definitely lead us on a path of something <laughs> that's my plan that's the worry <laughs> <laughs> all right well i'm really excited for today's episode we have a really great topic uh it's something that i think we've all ran into before yep. which is how do you handle solving a problem when you're in way over your head or just trying to learn a new skill that's just too big <laughs> right yeah yeah so first off what are you guys drinking i'm drinking my new favorite beer which is dank meme from triptych brewing in yeah. uh in savoy illinois so another local one they are amazing they, I, they really are <laughs> the i've always heard people good. talk about this beer i've never had it and i just want a lot of it I feel like 8-Bit, which is a local bar here, was one of the first ones to get it because they were, yeah, they're all about the memes over there, which is amazing. Um, but I feel like they got it first and I fell in love with it as soon as they got it. And it's like one of my staples whenever I go there and yeah. I'm not drinking hard liquor. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's a real clean. It's a hazy American pale ale and it's just like it's real citrusy and it's super clean and like it's just so good. I don't know. Yeah, eight bits where I had it first, and yeah, that's where I fell in love with it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a huge fan of pale ales that often either, so that's saying something. Hell yeah. Uh, I personally am having a one of my favorites, uh, mainly because I was up in Chicago earlier today, and whenever I am up there, I always have to stop and get. One of my favorite beers um, that probably is available locally here, too. I just have never been able to find it. Um, it would be Three Floyds Brewing Company Zombie Dust. It is yeah. A you have zombie <laughs> dust? I <Dude>. do. <laughs> can I so, have one? I I mean, if you want, I can bring some uh, to the space, maybe. Uh, you cannot maybe buy week. it in Peoria. You, you cannot. Yeah. Right. And it's that's how I always it is one of my favorite beers. If you ever <laughs> feel the need to get on my good side, please bring me zombie dust. <laughs> yeah, no, I uh I was up in Chicago pulling uh two nights in a row overnighters and uh one of the bars we went to before we started the work happened to have it and I was like, Oh, I actually gotta pick up a case of this before I go home. <laughs> Do they have it on tap? Yeah, it's so which is, good. On I tap. feel like is the best way. Yeah, like it is so well on tap. Yeah. Well. So, uh, <laughs> so my wife has a has a cousin and his husband. They actually live in uh, that town in Indiana where Three Floyds is. Oh, nice. Oh, really? So whenever we go there, we always stop by and I get some stuff. And we actually went on the tour last time we were there. That was super cool. Oh, they nice. Have art, they have artwork everywhere, and they actually we actually got to see the barrels that are there's only like a single rack. For the Dark Lord beer mm -hmm. for Dark Lord Day, yeah, and we got to see all that. Got to see their awesome bottling uh, machine, which I thought when I, when I saw that, I thought of Ted, you know, instantly because just <laughs> just massive multi million dollar machine where it just bottles and bottles and bottles going through conveyor belts and big old wheels, yeah, being filled and labeled and capped. It was just the coolest thing ever. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, every time we go to Rep Rat Fest, we always talk about stopping at Three Floyds, and then we spend too much time at Micro Center, so then we can't <laughs> go buy beer. I mean, the last time I think, um, I didn't go last year. I am going this year, which, again, uh, we'll be there. Please come see us. Um, we would we, love to see you. We have special announcements about that. 
but go oh, on do with we? your story. We do. Oh, cool. Uh, no, the, I didn't go last year, but I went the year before, and I think we spent like way too much time and way too much money because I think both me and you maxed out our credit cards, and we had to call our bank in order to actually get them reopened. Yes. Um, which was freaking great. That was a whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I bought a new laptop and you bought a drone and everyone else bought a whole bunch of filament. I love micro center. I hate so micro nice. center, but I love micro center. <laughs> so I am drinking at industry brewery nightcap and a crawler. Nice. The classic. Yep. I, I had to run to the space earlier. Um, cause I, I'm actually recording in 90% of my new home recording studio. Yay. I, I, I got all of the two by fours cut at the space cause I had needed them. I tried to cut it here at the circular saw, then realized I can't cut straight. <laughs> so I, Everyone I have to does use the that. miter saw, <laughs> but nice. I got this. So I actually have it all constructed with pocket screws, which oh, I didn't. Nice. So I've got like pocket screws going like in the same wood. I wasn't sure if that would work, oh. but yeah, so it's actually super sturdy. And I've got that's legit. Got the professional grade uh, acoustic blankets. Um, I've got two so far, and I'm still waiting on those two. If you heard uh, last week's podcast, where yep. I explained the whole story, yeah, <laughs> and why I'm short too. But yeah, I'm, it, even already now, it sounds awesome. But it, nah, that's awesome. I love pocket screws. I'd never used them before. I built the frame for the Massive, and uh, the face panels are all pocket screwed together. And after that, I was like, I want to use these for everything. Yeah, it's super <laughs> fun. I haven't used them again. So, you know, that's how that goes. <laughs> yeah. So Fair I bought enough. I bought the $20 Craig pocket screw kit. Mm -hmm. um, when we when I built our uh, bed frame, when we first moved in, we upgraded to a California King. Oh, nice. And like hell, I was going to pay for a California King frame. I mean, <laughs> yeah. just buying like the crap, the crappiest version I could find was 800 bucks. Yeah. Damn. So I found this awesome design online for a, uh, a very minimal platform bed. And it's only about $100 in what pine or whatever the cheap wood is. Mm -hmm. And it is mostly all pocket screws. And that thing is sturdy as hell. Nice. Damn. It's awesome. That will be not fun to move when you move. <laughs> <laughs> it, should, it should fit through a doorway. Yeah. That, the plan specifically said that. So oh, here's nice. hoping. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, as long as there's beer when you're moving, I'm I'm game. <laughs> I Noted. will watch and drive the truck, but that's all I'm really good for when I'm moving. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah, I'll hand you guys beer. Now I'll carry things if you want. Um, no. So uh, Rep Rat Fest this year, uh, we are sponsoring. We're yeah, a, we are. Yeah, we're a bronze level sponsor. So I'm pretty excited about that. We'll be doing interviews and uh, we also have uh, some a couple really cool things that I'm super excited about that aren't confirmed yet. So I'm not going to say them in case they fall through. Um, but thank you for not saying them. Yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm pretty stoked. I wasn't I'm, I'm not sure if I want to commit to it yet. So I'm glad you didn't say anything. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the, that's how I am, too. But what we will be doing is interviewing uh rep rappers and uh people of that nature all weekend at the booth so if you want to come talk to us about your 3d printer project or other projects that you've made uh we'd love to hang out and talk to you and uh uh saturday night drink with you and do all the things that we do at rep rap fest i'm so excited so yay woo yeah it's aiming to be a good year yeah yeah it's gonna be a hectic year for me because uh, I was telling Joe, now I'm, I'm the president of, of RCL now, yeah. and also I'm part we of forgot. this podcast. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> did, I, did I not say it yet tonight? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so not only am I the president of RCL, but I'm part of the podcast, and so we're both going to have booths there. So it's like I'm going to have to be bouncing back and forth. No, you're not. Between... Maybe. <sighs> no, so like... I have to represent both. You, you, you've only been to Murph once with us, right? Yeah, I couldn't go last year. I went the year before. Yeah. So the way River City Labs works at Rep Rap Fest is we just show up and we take up the largest chunk of show of, of any single organization and, and just kind of be like, what? We're here. 
and we got a whole lot of stuff. And we have arrived. <laughs> yes, that that's that's actually how we showed up last year. And uh, you know, there's there's no official RCL booth, so you're, you're not representing much. But you know, everyone's wearing the green, and you know, last year I think I gave like two walkthroughs to different people that like actually wanted to talk about our maker space. And I just like walked them around and was like, this is Ted and he makes this and this is Jason and he does boy scouts. And this is my giant stupid printer. And this is Josh. And he made this hot wheels car wall and like a couple of things like that. But yeah, you're not going to be bouncing back and forth like crazy. I, I think you're okay. overdoing it in your head unless you have something in your mind. That's not what I have in my head. Which is fine. No, I usually overthink everything. Yeah, I Fair usually enough. plan. I usually plan for the worst because then everything else is gravy. Yeah, as long as we have all of our banners and everything in the trailer Wednesday night or Thursday morning, that's really all you got to plan for. So, it's like herding okay. cats, and it's not a horse trailer. That... Yeah, have you have you tried herding cats? I it's have the worst. They're very snuggly. <laughs> And they, they just keep running out, and you're like, oh, why are you being cute and running away? <laughs> and you put Fair them back enough. in, like, meow. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we learned our lesson on the horse trailer thing. We're not doing that ever again. And, I uh, had that pop up as a uh, memory last year, which was freaking great. <laughs> nice. We've had really bad luck with trailers. We've had two major trailer accidents in, in the three years we've bought trailers. So... Yeah. Fing fingers crossed for a year two, no trailer incidents. Or yeah, year two. We'll see. We'll see. So in other news, I found an article on the Solder Doodle Plus, which is an open source soldering iron. Uh there is a there's a normal solder doodle, but he upgraded it, changed up the design, and has a much more focused um heating element. And it's only ten in, it it goes up to ten watts. But it has the equivalent heating capacity of like your 50 watt Weller or something like that. It's a really cool design. I'm a little annoyed that he stole the name from the Solid Doodle, which was a really good 3D printer that went defunct a couple of years ago. The Solder Doodle, the Solid Doodle. It's such a. Okay. <laughs> nah. <laughs> so it's... the case is fully 3D printed. Is it really? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, At first, I wondered if it was the same guy. And then I was going to be like, yeah, keep your branding going. But it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really like the features on it. It actually looks like a lot of Karen work went into this. And they really made something that is actually going to be nice to use. Um, and form fitting for you to be able to use it for a while. Like, if you're interested in, in doing this, it looks like something that would be awesome to work on. Yeah. Yeah, like it has a capacitive touch sensor to uh, adjust the power levels up and down. Mm -hmm. um, it has a micro USB port to charge. It'll last up to uh, one hour of continuous heat at full power. Battery life is like five to ten years. It only takes like three hours to fully charge. I mean, it's a really neat looking soldering iron. And it's all open source. So you're able to modify it however you want. Yeah. What I think is funny is one of the required tools to build the soldering iron is a soldering iron. How meta. That's always fun. <laughs> <laughs> you got to you got to be willing to go all in. Yep. In another vein of open source, um the Raspberry Pi Foundation released a tweet on the 4th um saying that they're they have now joined the Risk V Foundation as a silver member. Um they're planning on contributing to the uh a Linux kernel and the Debian port of the Raspberry Pi to help push forward the the world's uh, you know leading free and open instruction set architecture. And a lot of people are speculating as to what that means for the Raspberry Pi because for yes. those who don't know, the Risk V is the one of the the major open source uh, processor units. Yeah, their CPUs. What what I love about this tweet is the amount of people that aren't excited about the project but excited about taking their moment in in the the sunlight to correct raspberry pi on their use of gnu linux yeah it's it's annoying and um and 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 their uh 
punctuation in their use of GNU Linux. I I just I love it. I, it's like, it, do, do they go around to every other website that has a Linux port for something and be like, excuse me, is that GNU slash Linux? <laughs> or, or as I've recently taken to calling it, GNU plus Linux? <laughs> <laughs> what the? It's a good Lord, guys. Get alive. We all know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. In my, in my opinion, that's exciting just because, you know, maybe we'll see a Raspberry Pi in the future that has a RISC-V processor in it. Which will, for one thing, be more powerful than what they have currently. But yes, it'll it'll be that one step further to a fully open source uh, computer. And yeah, they have GPUs built into them too, don't they? Or they have a GPU unit? I'm not sure. I thought the newest one. I thought the B plus. No, did. no, the the Risk V. I think they have a an open source oh. GPU that they support, which would be. I'm not sure about that. Pretty neat. I have a single board computer with a GPU. Nice. So I did hear about a month ago that there were some um, security vulnerabilities in the RISC-V architecture and like the base instruction set. And because it's open source, you know, the community was able to figure it out, get that feedback promptly back to the, the RISC-V foundation. They were able to fix it. Like that's, huh. that's like the whole reason open source exists. You know, we now have this really open feedback loop. Yeah, but like as much as I love that, what about the Linux vulnerabilities that have been in the kernel since before Linux two that they've just known about, about those. And, and they let go. <laughs> and and that's go there, Joe. And that's the problem. <laughs> like they're like, those problems are real hard. We'll just let those go and hope no one notices them. That's what yeah. patches are for. You just, you just throw a nice little patch over that. Those vulnerabilities were there since they like go five. Yeah, especially like what the the open SSL. Yeah, and they just fixed them. Vulnerability that, that was like a decade. Sheesh. But you know, open source doesn't guarantee any sort of security. No, but and it, it's right, definitely a right. step in the right direction, opposed to closed source, where and you it's know, up, it's it's up to them to fix it. Mac OS it had those same deals, and Windows had the same deal. So I'm just poking yeah. trolls. Sorry, shouldn't. Do oh, I know. That. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Let's see. I found another article that was really interesting. I don't think we'll spend too much time on it, but it was just really neat. There's a guy who tried to underclock the ESP8266 microcontroller to see what would happen to the Wi-Fi um, controller on it. And what was really interesting was as he underclocked the base, the base frequency, let's see, the radio spectrum of, that the Wi-Fi broadcasted shrank. The, the center line stayed the same, but the, the outer limits shrank inwards if i'm explaining that correctly mm -hmm. um but the idea was it becomes impossible to using that same wi-fi protocol to connect to any sort of network or anything because you're now at a really awkward frequency that no other really route or anything can comprehend but what he found which is super interesting was that if you underclocked two esp 8266s this in the exact same way their their radios are both effed up in the exact same way they could still talk to each other but nobody oh. else could c talk to them because the radio the radio stuff is now all out of sync that is very cool so there's a lot of interesting applications for that yeah and you huh. know and i'll put the link in the show notes it, a lot of it went over my head because radio stuff becomes black magic after a certain point yeah <laughs> but i thought that was super neat because that opens up the opens up for like stealth iot yeah you know, network stuff like, I have my own insulated IoT network that can only deal with itself. Now, all these all these devices can talk to each other, but nothing else. And like, there's all kinds of fun little uses for something like that. I, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that could be. That could course, be really cool. Of course, I'm pretty for, sure your bandwidth went down a lot, but it's yeah, still but, super neat. Like if you're gonna run like an insulated network like that, it's probably going to be in a small area, you know. Mm -hmm. So losing your bandwidth probably wouldn't hurt too much. This is this it, that's pretty neat. Yeah. Again, a useful feature of open source. Yep. A feature that <laughs> I technically a bug that actually turned out to potentially be a feature that nobody would have ever found with a closed source piece of hardware. Right. Very cool. Yeah. Speaking of open source, the Electro Noobs, which I'm pretty sure we've talked about before, has come up with a really awesome 
DIY smartwatch that you can build yourself. Yeah. And I've seen, I, I've been following several smart DIY smartwatch projects, but they've all been super bulky and really odd and not really worth your time. But this new one, if you've ever had a Pebble smartwatch before, it is almost the same footprint of that, but without the ink display and a tiny little, um, was it LCD or OLED? I'm not sure. I'm still rocking uh, my I thought Pebble. he said it was an OLED. Yeah, it's an okay, OLED. Yeah. So it's a little OLED yeah. display. But it's all based on the, the AT Mega 328, which is you know what's on your Arduino Nanos. So it's all programmable through the Arduino IDE if you have a, the FTDI adapter. But it's, it's just the form factor is amazing. It's just so tiny. It's all one circuit board with a bunch of um, surface mount components. And then the OLED is mounted on top of that board, and that's it. Um, there's the, the wrist straps, which is awesome, are built into the circuit board itself, like the, the wrist strap holes, I should say. That's pretty neat, too, because PCBs are usually very strong. Like, yeah. The, the first problem I've seen with a lot of the DIY smartwatches is they use 3D printed cases, and the cases have the watch strap holes in them. Right. And a lot of times their designs are fairly weak. So, like, you could make a watch case for this and, uh, you know, utilize that PCB hole and have a nice, secure wrist. I'm, I want to build one. I do, too. I, I kind of do. Like, it is just like a cool form factor. It's like um, even the stuff that he was talking about, he was making it specifically for you to be able to customize yourself. Um, and he was kind of open sourcing the whole thing. So that was uh, pretty cool. He was already putting a temperature sensor on there and a battery that was actually going to be um, pretty low end. So you were able to use it for a good amount of time. I think he said he was getting about a day on idle time. Um, which is oh, pretty nice. good for the battery that he was putting in there. Um, like it, it's just like a tiny little milliamp battery. Um, but it was, it was definitely a cool kind of video to watch. Like if you have the chance, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, it's definitely a cool project. And he said, he's going to be putting out more videos, um, going through the whole process. So, yeah. And he's yeah, already published awesome. the Gerbers and the bomb for it. So yeah. I'm looking at a stack of Osh Park vouchers right now that could totally yeah. fit three smartwatch PCBs in a in a free Osh Park voucher. Just saying, man, I'm about it. Uh, I told it. myself <laughs> no side projects this year. This hey man, rough. Hey man, makers get sidetracked. Makers <laughs> get sidetracked. If you're making one, Joe, how hard would it be just to make a second one while you're at it? <laughs> where's the fun in that i want to see how you do it. hey hey can you do this project for me joe <gasps> <laughs> joe uh, you are so knowledgeable i expect you to do this for me for free because we're such good friends in next week's episode <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk now let's talk about people leveraging your skills for their gain Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be rough it's gonna be a rough one i want a good one first all right so for this week's topic it what did we say it was it was how do you handle solving a challenge when you're weighing over your head and you're not sure if the problem seems too big for you to handle how do you do it breaking down the elephant into bite-sized bits you, you said it all wrong dude you no, gotta no. say you gotta you gotta you gotta lead it with how do you eat an elephant? Yeah, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. There's gotta be a good oh, dad joke morbid. for there. <laughs> <laughs> so do either of you have any examples of that? I have tons of examples. Should we just dive right in? Uh yeah. Alright, yes. so a really, really th- this is usually how this topic comes up at the makerspace. A new maker comes in and says, Hi, I want to make a self-playing guitar. (laughs) I don't know how to do anything. And we say, All right. Let's sit down and talk about the project. And usually, the way we try to break that stuff down is into a number of smaller projects. And those smaller projects may or may not end up 
or may or may not end up uh, benefiting your final project. So, um, you know, with a project like that, you're going to have to learn some code bits, some manufacturing bits, some design bits, and it, all across the board. And that's a pretty ambitious project, right? So you break it up into smaller, less ambitious projects so that you can do it without getting overwhelmed. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Um, recently, we had a guy come into the makerspace and he had a very complex CNC project that he wanted to do. And uh, I said, have you ever cut anything on a CNC? And he said, no. And I was like, have you ever done anything in CAD? And he said, no. And have you ever programmed anything in CAM? And he said, no. And he was very flustered and very overwhelmed. And um, you know, I said, maybe the first thing you need to do is sit down and make a sign for your garage. And I feel like that got him flustered too, because that wasn't, his end goal was he his end goal was a much more complex project. He didn't want to make a sign for his garage. Yeah. But the the simplistic project that might take me 15, 20 minutes, but could take him two or three days. He would learn so much in that simple project that would get him closer and closer to that goal. And like. Um, you know, breaking even. Even that is a really, really big bite. That's like eating a whole leg of an elephant all at once. So you, know, you have to break. Sometimes you have to break the bites into bites to make them manageable. Right. Right. So I went through the exact same thing earlier this year or earlier last year, I should say, where uh, I had a lot of what well, maybe even the year before that. It was when I was unemployed. I had a lot of time on my hands and. I've been wanting to learn how to use the CNC router. We had that small uh, probotics router at the space. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, just go ahead and take it home and just get it, get it to work. And that was, it was pretty daunting at first, but you know, the, it, you have to start out with, well, how do I even get the machine to move? Cause it didn't. Yeah. Well, I had to, I had to learn, you know, how to get Linux CNC set up on a computer. And then, well, how do I, then configure the machine in Linux CNC. So I have to figure out, well, you know, you have to figure out how to get the, the motors to step in the right order. Mm -hmm. So how many, how many steps does the step motor have to take to get the one full revolution? And is there any gearing involved? You know, take the threading into the threading of the rods into account. So you get to that point and those are all just small sections. Like, well, how do I get Linux C installed on this random point of sale terminal that Christian brought to the space a while ago. Those are the best CNC Got, computers. They, they are great. <laughs> um, side note. Um, <laughs> then after that, how do I configure a machine? So these are all just very tiny, very tiny steps um, yeah. toward and then the goal. Then it's, well, once I get it configured, how do I actually get it to move around? Once you get to move around, it's, it, that's about it for at least the machine portion. Well, how do I get a job ready for the machine? Well, now you're getting into the CAD and CAM portion, which luckily I've done a bit a, a dip bit of CAD before, so I know how to use Fusion 360 quite a bit. But I've never done the CAM portion of it before, so I started with just the basic square, and even that was a bit problematic, just because Fusion gives you a ton of stuff in CAM. It's yes. not Fusion. It's not very. <laughs> it's a great CAM. <laughs> It's not it's a good... great cam. It's not beginner friendly cam. No, it's like here is a Fusion whole window of options. It's not beginner friendly <laughs> compared to some other CAD packages. It, it very much is, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So I had to, I had to, you know, struggle my way through learning basic Fusion cam just to get a G code file out that then the the machine could read. Then I finally got a square cut out, and that itself was. You know, again, a lot of these small challenges all building up to what the end goal was just a simple square. Well, and that's like, I'm going to steal a, uh, a story from a friend of mine who I've also had this happen to me a million times, but he, he recently kind of told me it again. And it reminded me of this whole thing was, um, I encountered this a lot, um, uh, when I was in video editing, 
um, we would have people come in um, to our studio and would be like, hey, what can we do? And we'd have our salesperson be like, um, yeah, we can. Uh, you see this green screen right here? We can put you on the moon and we can do all of this great stuff. And it's only going to take like 10 minutes. Like we'll get it done in an instant. It's movie magic. It just happens. And if you know anything about editing, that is not at all the case. No, not at um, all. It's it it's even just take ten minutes to edit this podcast, and there's no video. Yeah, yeah. right. No, it's it, like anything to do with like editing or especially green screen. Like green screen takes forever. It takes a lot of processing, um, and it takes a lot of just knowing that knowledge in order to do that. When it comes to like some of the other stuff that um, I'm still learning at the space, like I've been involved at the space for close to three and a half, four years now at this point. Um, and I'm still learning cat and camp and trying to get some of that stuff down. I started more in a background of, uh, modeling in, uh, what is the term I'm looking for? Maya. Um, yeah, I, I use Maya. So I was mesh modeling. I used mesh modeling for my, my stuff. So my values were non-existent. They, I just modeled and I didn't have to be constrained by, um, actual real world values. So my brain is like actually flipped when it comes to being able to model in like fusion and stuff like that, because it's so much different 3d modeling. You actually have to do all of these actual measurements and all of these calculations for everything that is, it's so helpful because it comes up with such a better product, but when it comes down to it, it's a lot more, um, it's a lot different than stuff like that, but it's like, People will come up to you with this expectation of like, oh, I, we, we can do this. We can get this knocked out and just be able to do that. And it's like, no, you really, you have no idea yeah. <laughs> what you're asking right now. <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, Christian, I've been doing CAD cam for my job for 13 or 14 years. I'm still learning stuff. So... And I do, and I'm not one of those engineers that uh, like does CAM or CAD every other month. Like it's my day yeah. in, day out, and I'm still constantly learning things. So it's, you know, it, it's a process. Well, and it's especially it, like CAD and CAM, literally, if you take it at its root, it's making the imaginary become reality um, because you are basically inventing something new, even if it may be something like, um, small end or whatever, if you're doing that, but you are taking something that is literally a thing in 3d space and making it into reality yeah. and giving the constraints for that. So you're always going to be learning something new with that because you're, you're taking something that doesn't exist and making it exist. And I feel like that's always going to have some kind of learning curve on it. Yeah. And it's, awesome. that's what I, that's what I love about CAD so much. Um, when I, when I first got my 3d printer, you know, as with everybody who get, first gets their 3D printer, they just download STLs off a of Thingiverse and print them. Yep. yep. But the real power in printing doesn't come until you start to learn to make your own models. And then it's just like, poof, like mm -hmm. your, your mind just explodes. You're just like, anything <laughs> I can think of. And then once you get into, you know, I started with Tinkercad, which was, you know, super basic stuff. And I quickly reached the, the ceiling of that. And now I learned Fusion 260, and now it's like anything I can think of. It the limitation is only in my in my in my head. Yeah, you know anything I anything I can yeah. think of, as long as I know how to do it in Fusion, I can model it and make it work. And then I can either print it or cut it out of the router. Like it's really making your own models is is awesome. Yeah, because it's like anything is possible. Yeah. So I guess like because this this comes up to me a lot and. I've kind of told you guys before, um, and even on the podcast, I've mentioned that, that I got burned out on a lot of like my video editing and stuff like that, even when it comes to like other projects. Um, like right now I'm doing a website. Um, I'm helping somebody do uh, a group, do a website with them and I'm designing everything for them and doing all the coding for them. And it's, it's really easy, but, um, what is your guys's normal reaction when you get asked this? Cause like my, recently unless it's somebody that i really really like and i'm like you guys are awesome i will help you out it's very much been like no like we're like i want to help you 
but you have to be willing to help yourself. And especially when it's come to video editing and special effects and stuff like that. You're getting ahead I know, of yourself. I can s- That's next week's well, episode. This this is a whole thing. <laughs> oh, no, this, yeah. This no, is no, no, a no. two-part episode. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting yeah. all geared up now. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I got ahead of myself. No, you, no, you're, you're no, fine. No, you, you totally triggered me now. Because <laughs> I'm a... I'm a career IT guy, so like that's my whole thing is is people coming to me with, oh, you, you do computers, right? Yeah, and that's it. It's like you're you you know computers, and it's taken me years to wean them all off of me. More so because I I I helped family members and friends with computer stuff, just random stuff. But you know, it always comes back. You know, oh well, Aaron fixed this, and now th- four months later, something's broken. It must be something he did. Yeah, and I had enough of that. That yeah. it's like whatever. I'm just not gonna help anybody anymore. No, nah, we were we we're. I, I'm I'm gonna try and get back. I'm sorry. Yep. <sighs> By biting off something bigger than you can chew. Steering um, the ship. <sighs> Steering the ship. Yeah. No. So like. No. It. <laughs> um. Do you have Do you have an example of a project that you you started and it seemed. When when you started it, you didn't really understand how big the project was going to turn out. Uh, yeah, no, I actually, I mean, if we're going, um, that w- literally happened last night, um, with work. Uh, so it's not necessarily home project, but it was something that I can relate to. It was like, um, I started, or you know what? No, I wanted to talk about the the kegerator. That one actually was, um. That one was a huge thing that I didn't understand. Um, and that's more makey. <laughs> yeah. um, so the kegerator and everything was this cool project. And I kind of just like had it in my head. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I have a cabinet that's a refurbed cabinet. Um, had all the old electronics in it. I'm like, I want to take this and I want to do something cool with it. Um, and just the like from everything doing that was it quickly escalated because the first thing, the first thing that I was like, I really want to do with this was, Hey, I want to actually custom cut my own controller. And that's a whole thing. (laughs) Um, now I, that was actually one of the first times I forced myself to start learning fusion was I had to create the file. Um, one of the other members at the space was willing to help me cut, um, because he had his, uh, router up and running and he was like, I'll just cut it for you. Just get me the file. Mm -hmm. And so that was a whole thing, um, was me learning how to get to this point of, uh, I have to use fusion in order to cut this custom controller. Um, boy, was that hard? (laughs) Um, because it, if you know anything about gaming controllers or anything about fight sticks, Um, They are very precise in their measurements for everything because everything has to be very particular for um, how your finger movements go. And because I wanted to use this for doing fighting games like classic Street Fighter and stuff like that, um, it had to be very good. Um, And so that was a whole thing was uh, that was just the first hurdle. Then it came to, um, okay, I have to make this cabinet structurally sound, although that doesn't sound like a huge thing. The cabinet was rather old. It was like a 60s era cabinet. And so that was a whole thing of getting this thing actually working. Um, The marquee was another thing of like actually getting it lit properly. I wanted to use LEDs and it just didn't have the power ran for that. So I had to rerun power and all that. Then getting to the actual kegerator, I knew nothing about kegerators. And like all that, I knew it was a refrigerator that had a keg in it with a CO2 tank. And that's about it. I didn't know about pressure regulation. I didn't know about like filling it for a day ahead of time. I didn't know about lines or anything like that. And so like taking on that project, it immediately shot me into like, holy crap, to the point of where I was dating my ex at the time, that cabinet probably sat in my in my apartment for about two months because I just got intimidated by it. And I was just like, I don't know what the fuck to do. I don't even know where to begin. And it wasn't until one of our members who was cutting the controller for me pulled me aside. He was like, are you actually going to send me the the file for this to be able to do that? I, I need to cut this soon. I'm going to be 
um, getting ready to move. Um, and I was like, I guess I have to like, cause if you're going to take down your router, I need to actually cut this. And so that was the whole thing of like getting the ball rolling. Once I started it, I steamrolled it. But then I also set a date for myself of like, I want to be done by this date. And that also helped of like, I need to actually get done by then. So the, the cabinet itself was a huge undertaking. Um, and that whole experience has kind of made me go, I really want to make version two, but I haven't started version two because I know the minute I start going into it again, it's going to get to that point where I feel intimidated and I just have to get past that again. Why would you date your ex? <laughs> oh, God. Or was she not your ex at the time? She was not. She was. <laughs> Thank this you, the, Aaron. This is Out of all away. of that, that's what you take. All of that, you take that. She was not my ex at the time. She, I was dating her. Okay. And she lived at my house for a period of time. I just got time. really hung up on that. <laughs> it kind of threw off the whole story. <laughs> God. Jeez. Fucking. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm really drunk yeah. right now. And this is apparently yeah, the F-bomb no, episode. I couldn't tell. <laughs> um, so... Yep. Sorry. <laughs> that was my bad. <laughs> now we got to make it explicit. We should just stick with that. It was way more fun to be able to cuss on the other podcast I did. Um, and let's face it, no kids are listening to a bunch of guys drink and complain about their lives. I mean, talk about making things. Um, nah. What do you if got? If you're a kid and you feel offended by what we have said, <laughs> please email us and I so like we can prove Joe wrong. I hope we get please. a flood of emails now. So, Aaron, you got anything? Because I've got projects out the wazoo I could talk about where I started and was like, what did I do? <laughs> I feel like that's every project before uh, Murph for you, in all honesty. <laughs> I finished most of those. All right. Nah. It, for me, those are the best projects because that, that's when you know you're learning something. Yes. And that's, and that's when I, what I like to do. But I feel like my, my router discussion earlier kind of was a good one for me. Yeah. Hey, for me, this podcast was, was that. Well, yeah. actually, before, before the podcast, it was when I started doing um, recorded tutorials for some software. And uh, suddenly I needed to edit audio in a way that didn't sound like complete and utter echoey garbage. And, uh, and so then it went from like, oh, I'll use my gaming headset to talk about this software to, oh, I need to get an actual microphone. And I need to learn actual audio editing software and I need to learn noise reduction techniques and I need to learn microphone techniques. And it, it turned into this like four month spiral uh, to do one video. Dude, so. audio is such a rabbit hole. It is. Oh, I've been in yeah. it for the past month and it, it just it it's so so complex, so deep. It's so fun well, though. It, I really enjoy yeah. it. it. There there really is no end. Because like you, if you really go down the audio rabbit hole, there you could you end up building your own studio in your house, like Aaron has just done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that's you just start compiling on because you always want to make it sound better. Yep, like that's mm -hmm. that's just the way it is. Yeah, and it, the guy I was doing the audio for, he, every time I'd send him a video, he's like, "Your your audio sounds great. I don't know why you're concerned." And I'm like, "But it could be better." <laughs> <laughs> it's story of my life. Yeah. Nah, that's that's what it comes down to. I did yeah. fine, but it could always be better. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, man. like um, I, I feel like this this whole episode has been CNC heavy, but yeah, you know, my my very first CNC machine I built years ago was my initial uh baby step rabbit hole, and it it started with me finally taking the step of learning Linux. Because you know, mm -hmm. before that, I had dual booted a couple laptops and been like, Ubuntu's kind of neat. And uh, this was in the 
uh, 804 stable version days. So this was a long time ago. Um, wow. You're when, old. When you really had to work to get Linux to work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, I started there. And, and just like you, it was like, all right, now I need to learn what won't. Do I have 1.8 degree steppers or 0.09 degree steppers? And you know, how many steps are in a revolution if they're 1.8 degrees? It's 200 if you're listening. Um, and <laughs> what is micro stepping and why do I care? And you know, what is what are unipolar drivers versus bipolar drivers? And what are the different wiring configurations I can do? And I, I dove down this huge rabbit hole of machine building and it was all to build a robot arm. I haven't built a robot arm yet. So <laughs> I haven't even started. I built a lot of other machines that have gotten me closer to my goal of building a robot arm, but I haven't built a robot arm yet. So, yeah, you know, one of these years that might happen. But if you take baby stepping, yeah, if you take anything away from all of this, it's when you start a project that you know, is, is completely out of your comfort zone. You need to be okay with the fact that that project might not be the first thing in that realm that you make. You might have to, yeah. to take some steps and it might, you know, it might go from like, Oh, I wanted to get this project done for this event to like, maybe you're going to have to do that event next year because it's just so much effort to take it on. Um, because you, know, you might not always be able to find that person like, like you had, uh, Chris to um, to cut out your 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 fight stick pad or you know I had a person that kind of walked me through my initial CNC guide thing but I was also paying him so you know you might end up having to, to pay somebody to learn some skills and you need to be okay yeah. with that because that person gained those skills through hard given time and they may have paid to get the skills. Next week's episode is going to be a good episode, but it's going to be all about you know, people making unreal expectations, unrealistic expectations on you giving up your skills and your time to teach them and yep. how that's it's it's not OK. Um, it's it's OK to give up your time, but it's not OK for people to expect you to. So, yep. Good two-parter. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, so we're about the 50-minute mark. Do you guys have anything else you want to add? Not tonight. I Man, I, really, you're, you want to hear another Sherpa episode, you're probably going to hear me go, go ham next week. Yep. So I'm excited be ready. for next week's episode. <laughs> but no, nah, I'm good. All right. Well, if uh, if any of you guys out there have any uh, questions or if you want to hear anything specific on the podcast, feel free to reach out to us um, in any way you feel necessary, whether that's social media or our website or our subreddit or our email um, makers on or, tap at gmail dot com. Yeah. Which is on the website. Hey, you know, I'm just putting it out there. Yep. Thanks. So with that. Keep making stuff. This is the end of the episode.